All right, everybody, welcome to Ryan Hyatt's Raiderland. We don't know what the heck we're even calling these things. A little rock rolling to remember, a little look back in time, a little trip down memory lane. We're going to be bringing a lot of these to you this summer. We thought with the Big 12 baseball tournament going on this week in Arlington at Global Life, what better way to start it off than looking back at the only Big 12 baseball tournament Texas Tech has ever won. And that was, and this stings a little bit to say it, 25 years ago in Oklahoma City, the inaugural Big 12 tournament at the Bricktown Ballpark, the second ever Big 12 tournament, Texas Tech would go in and win it. A big reason, or at least uh, a reason why, you know, uh, nobody went to jail that week, Texas Tech pitcher Zach Stewart. And he joins us now. Zach, it's a pleasure to be able to have you on the podcast tonight and, uh, you know, talk about some semi-true stories as much as we can get away with them. Ryan, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. But you need to check your math because clearly that wasn't 25 years ago. That would make me an old guy. Yeah. Uh, hey, listen, at least your uh, age is still starting with a four. Some of us have uh, crossed that Rubicon a little bit. I must say, you look better than you've ever looked. Uh, your your video picture today, perfect. A very good choice on your part. Uh, True. Well, let's let's go back to before we go back in time. Uh, you know, tell folks a little bit about your time at Texas Tech with Larry Hayes coming in from South Lake Carroll because you were a part of a really, I think, a unique era as that program was making the leap from the Southwest Conference into the Big 12, finding you know their way into the NCAA tournament for the first time there in 95 a little bit. You know, For you, what was it like being a part of that era of Texas Tech baseball big picture? Uh, very eye-opening. You know, when, when I came in that, that first year, you know, that was the first, the first year after they started to have a little bit of success, you know, and getting to see guys like, like Clint Bryant and Jason Totman and, and Travis Smith and, and seeing that those guys, the way they went about things and that they were just starting to kind of get the program rolling in the, in the right path. And we were starting to recruit a little bit better guy, uh, to come into the program and, uh, just a, a really great time. And, and the belief there was that, Hey, we're pretty good here and, and we're going to open some people's eyes. Uh, and do some really cool things. So just just a really transitional time, I think, for the program in general. In 1997, you guys win the regular season, play an epic Big 12 tournament there at All Sports Stadium that we could probably do a full week's worth of podcast on that, playing into the finals and the uh, uh, the beatdown of Oklahoma State in the Saturday night game. But we'll, we'll fast forward to 1998. A year after that, Joe Dillon has moved on. There's a little bit of turnover, but the core guys are still there. Maybe refresh uh, the memory of some folks, players like Josh Bard still there, Shane Wright. Who were some of your teammates that year in 98 that were making it happen? Yeah, gosh, you know, when, when, when you look at the, you know, when you look at the hitters, you know, obviously it, it, it probably starts with the two guys you just mentioned there. You know, Josh Bard coming off a freshman All-America season, uh, you know, Keith Ginner that I don't know if there's, if there's ever been a better two strike hitter uh, than that guy and just a you know prolific guy himself. Um, but just a whole lot of guys coming back that, you know, we had confidence in um, that we could go get the job done. Maybe not the big names that we had in 97, uh, you know, but you look at Kevin Jordan and Jason Huth um, and, and yeah. some of those guys. And, you know, and you, you forget until you start looking back on the stats that, you know, gosh, Kevin Jordan hit 17 dingers and, and Hootie hit double digits. And there was a whole lot of guys in double digit home runs that year. And, and so, again, despite the fact we didn't have the big names, uh, there was a belief that we were just as good as those guys, even maybe less Joe Dillon. Um, you know, and then you look at the at the pitching staff, and it, it started and ended with Shane. Um, and and there's never been as pure a Friday night guy um, that, that I've seen, you know, even though he probably wouldn't pitch in, in today's game with everything being about velo. Um, <laughs> but, you know, between Shane and, and Monty Ward and myself and Brad Ralston and and uh, just just a ton of guys that that knew what we were doing and and could eat up some innings and and kind of mix and match where where Coach Hayes and Coach Anderson needed us. Boy, and it was a stacked Big Twelve that you guys were living in. And and I had to go back and double check just a few things before we sat down and visited tonight. You know, the the NCAA landscape was a little different. It was a forty eight team field. You guys were kind of not sideways, but scuffling through the month of April. And as, as y'all closed out the month, a sweep of Kansas State uh, took two of three from Oklahoma. I had forgotten that that Friday night Oklahoma game, by the way, was a 15-to-1 boat race the wrong direction. 
But it really, <laughs> after that, this team seemed to gel going to Oklahoma City. Now, I, I don't, I, I don't think it'd be fair to say you guys were on the outside looking in of an NCAA tournament invite, but you guys still had some work to do uh, when it was getting into the tournament. Do you remember what the mindset was going back to Oklahoma City that year in '98 after playing to the finals in '97? Yeah, I, I think that there was, you know, some some kind of nagging, um, you know, unfinished business with us that, you know, we believed that we were as good as anybody in the Big 12. But like you said, it it did take us a little bit of time to gel there at the beginning of the season. And, you know, it was kind of one of those deals where, you know, you drop a, a conference game here and you drop a conference game there. And despite the fact that we were playing well, um, you know, we didn't win the Big 12 when a lot of us, you know, because of the experience from the year before, believed that we were we were the best team. So, you know, kind of rolling into the tournament, it was a whole lot of like, hey, just just hold on. Let us show you what we can do. Like we're rolling now. We've got everything figured out. And now now let's build some momentum into the tournament um, so we, you know, we can get a good seed going into the, the regionals um, and, and go out and win this thing and show people what we're actually all about. Yeah. You know, and we, we talk about how stacked the league was that year. a and would win the regular season 21 and nine Baylor with Charlie Carter in that emerging team uh, right there with you guys. They were 18-10. Tech ended up 18-11 and 11 with that nice rally at the end. And uh, it's easy to forget how good Oklahoma was. They were still very good that year at 17-11. Missouri was 17-12. and 12, And Oklahoma State came into the tournament there 15-12. and 12. Only six teams would make the field going to Bricktown, which, by the way, I don't know if you agree with me or not. One, I could just as soon get rid of the Big 12 tournament now the way nobody values it. But two, at least just only take six teams and make something matter. I mean, it was an absolute knife fight in a phone booth taking only six teams back in the day of the Big 12. Yeah, I, I think this letting everybody in and, and whatnot, you know, there's so much talent in college baseball spread out evenly these days that, you know, you, you let, you know, an eight seed in, hey, they can beat anybody on any day if, if they're one pitcher that they've got. You know, and, and you lose that first or second game and now you're in a bind. You know, I, I think the regular season should mean something. Um, and so I, I'd, I'd support the idea of, of keeping it kind of exclusive at a, at a six team deal. All right. So we get to Bricktown. You guys uh, had seen it being built the year before when you walked out there that first workout that first day. And this was before we were playing a ton of college games and at Minute Maid or, at, you know, Globe Life or anything like that. What was the feeling just going into the facility that first time for that tournament there? You, you know, that that's your first taste where you, you, you kind of felt like a pro pro guy there. You know, when, when we got into town that, that first day, uh, we all went down and, and caught the AAA game uh, down there. And you thought, man, I get, I get to play at this place next couple of days and, and look at all these name guys that I know there at the facility. And, and it, it was just kind of a – a huge eye opener for us because, you know, we just hadn't ever played anything like that. If you think about it, I mean, really, um, you know, Olsen there at AM and m and the ditch at, in Austin. I mean, those were kind of the biggest places that we played and they don't hold right. a hand to Bricktown. So very much a, oh my God, I'm in pro baseball moment for us. <laughs> First game, they knew who to pair up. It was going to be the three, four matchup, Texas Tech and Oklahoma. Um, this was a huge night in America. Do you remember what happened that night on TV? I do not. It was the Seinfeld finale. <laughs> so uh, pro probably good for all of us that uh, baseball was not televised those days. I, I would have hated to see what our what our ratings would have been. Uh, but I, I, I do know this as a, as a quick aside that uh, I remember when we checked in the hotel uh, right down there in the Bricktown uh, that I believe the Rolling Stones and I believe yep. in sleep were playing. And I remember we walked out to go load up on the bus. I think it was for practice. And there was 9,000 screaming people out there. And we thought, holy smokes, look at the crowd we bought, brought. And then we figured out, oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're here for NSYNC. So, uh, yeah, and then the next night to have the Rolling Stones crowd in there was a bit was a bit different crowd, but uh, pretty interesting that we all thought they were there to watch us and found out otherwise. Man, there were a few guys off that team that might have could have passed for like an NSYNC and a boy band. I'm thinking Steve Richardson might have had a shot. Oh, 100%. I mean, if, if you'd have put his moves on stage with those guys, I, I think it's pretty much over. Him, Scooter Martinez, I think this could happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The game was was a really good game. Texas Tech would win 5-1. to one. But there was a moment in that game because to celebrate the opening of the Big 12 tournament, why not hand out 13,000 seat cushions 
I'll let you tell the story from here about one of the most memorable moments of Big 12 history that had nothing to do other than just a disputed play at the plate. Yeah, I just remember being in the in the dugout and uh, close play at the plate. Um, their guy gets gets banged. Uh, they call him out, you know, bang, bang play at the at the plate. And here come a sea of seat cushions. Um, and, and, and I just remember thinking, what in the world is going on? You know, and, and getting pulled off the field and wondering, you know, what, what do we do? I mean, none of us had ever seen anything like that before, you know, but those things were downright dangerous. Everybody talks about the tortillas at at, uh, at the football games being thrown. But, you know, those things were weapons and, and guys were doing pretty good at, at hucking them from the upper decks and, and hitting guys with them. So I, I've just truly never seen anything like that before. And gosh, you, you kind of wish social media was around back in those days. We might have made Sports Center with with those clips. I mean, Landreth was out there, uh, Jason Landreth out there in the right was just dodging him for what seemed like forever. And I, I can't remember how long the delay was. It didn't seem to affect it, but did it add just a little bit more energy even to what was already a high energy setting for you guys? Oh, 100%, 100% it did, you know, because that just, I think it kind of solidified us even more that it was sort of a us against the world mentality anyway, you know, and, and it's supposed to be at a neutral site. You're playing in Oklahoma City, which is basically OU's backyard, you know. And so we had a good turnout with our fan base, but it wasn't anything like Oklahoma had. And so that just solidified it in even more is that, you know, hey, we're handing it to these guys and their fans are so frustrated that they're getting beat that they're just going to throw seat cushions at us. So it was at that point you kind of knew, hey, we've got them uh, and let's let's really just kind of step on the gas and, and bury them right here. Needed a big outing by Shane Wright. You got it. We haven't really talked about it. By the time the tournament rolled around, you guys were really shorthanded on pitching. It sets up a matchup against Baylor in that 2-3 game the next night. Y'all would win 11-4, but maybe walk us through. I think I don't I don't have uh, the box score in front of me. I, I, I don't remember you pitching in the Oklahoma game, but I'm pretty sure because you guys had had some epic battles against those Baylor left-handed hitters that you were out there, I think, on the mound in that Tech Baylor 11-4 win. What was that night like? Yeah, that that was a night, like you said. I mean, we were a bit shorthanded on the on the bump after we got through Shane. Um, and so you just sort of knew it was kind of all hands on deck situation. Um, like you said, when we we played in Waco uh, that year, you know, I'd, I'd kind of got to their lefties a little bit. Um, truthfully, they got to me a little bit because I remember balking three times there in Waco, <laughs> uh, not being too happy about it. But you know, um, just kind of came and had a little bit of success flipping sliders up there as always at those guys. Um, but hey, when the offense puts 11 on the board, you, you got to win those games, right? And that was that was the mentality is that the hitters knew, hey, we got to pick these guys up a little bit. Let's go get that second W and put ourselves in a good spot. And uh, I mean, shoot, they throw up 11 runs. You, you, you should win that ball game. Frank Anderson, obviously the pitching coach at Texas Tech at that time, a, a, a master motivator, some might say. Uh, for you guys during that tournament, what did he have to say about just kind of weathering storms and, and, and you guys are going to have to be out there. You're just going to have to figure out a way to get guys out that there's, I, that you are the cavalry. There ain't anybody else coming in. It, it was, it was just, Hey, when your number's called, you come out and do your job and go as long as you can and hard as you can. But, but we need outs, right? Like we, we just need to keep advancing the outs. Our offense is good enough. They're going to put runs on the board. Just keep the crooked numbers off the off the scoreboard and do your job. You know, we got a good solid defense. Just, you know, get outs. That's that was the whole key was just keep advancing and getting outs and limit the damage when when guys did get on base. Uh AM comes back and gets you guys in the third round in eleven to seven game. And uh my memory of that, you know, is, is they kind of got out a little bit early and just uh, stiff armed it, stiff armed it. It would set up, though, an epic final day where you guys would have to come back to win it. You were going to have to win two games, and it would start off against Oklahoma in the Jason Landreth special. But you go to bed th that night, and you wake up knowing you got to get 27 outs two times. And again, I think you guys used eight pitchers maybe total yeah. that entire tournament. What was that like? I mean, it, it was just the confidence. know Monty Ward or Shane Wright that as long as I can go out there and throw strikes and get ground balls um, and, and again just keep clicking off those outs that, that we're going to put runs on the board right there, there's very few teams in, the, in that big 12 that year or even in the nation I thought could could keep up with us um, so it was just hey just 
keep throwing strike, keep working fast. Defense will, will do their job behind you and, and um, go as long as you can and hard as you can. That, that was really just the mentality is, hey, next guy up, he's going to do his job too, period. Jason Landreth was on that all-tournament team, and uh, he had two throws in that game uh, against Oklahoma uh, in the 4-3 to three victory that were obviously huge. You guys uh, – and, and that may have been the lowest – I think it was the lowest scoring game in the entire Big 12 tournament that year. For, for kids today, to play a 4-3 game that deep in that tournament in 1998, what would that be today, like 0.5 to nothing? <laughs> Probably, you know, I mean, and that's that's what, uh, you know, the crazy thing is to me, you you look back again at, at, at like Shane's numbers that year. That, that I think he was like 12 and one with a two something ERA th throw into those rocket launcher minus five bats. I mean, the, the kids today just don't understand, you know, what a live ball era that was, you know, in the kind of the Skip Burton, you know, gorilla ball era. So to, to get a three to one game, just just absolutely unheard of then. After y'all won that, was there any doubt in your mind that you'd be able to come back and get A&M in the nightcap? Is it would be, I believe, Eric Cooper taking the ball that night and just uh, scuffling, scuffling hard against that lineup? Yeah, no. I mean, uh, clearly, you know, you, you kind of get to that last game and, and you know, our staff was was stretched out pretty good at that point. Like you said, Coop was kind of the the last guy up. And, and uh, you know, if memory serves, he hadn't really thrown a whole lot in the, no. the previous months. And it was – you know, down to only of a couple of us. And, and so, you know, Coach Anderson, you know, gave the ball to Coop and, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately did, you know, had a bit of a, a bit of a tough start. And, you know, um, it's obviously worked out pretty good for me that, you know, I got to come in pretty early and the message was, hey, we're in trouble. There's ain't nobody else down there. Just just get us some outs and keep, keep us in the game. I, and I'm trying to remember, did you close it out that night? I did. I did. Yeah, I, I went uh, seven, seven and two thirds. I came in in the second inning. I think Coop went an inning yeah. and third. I think I went seven and two thirds. I couldn't remember exactly which inning you came in, but I, I, I remember you closing it out. And it was kind of interesting back back in the day. Very few Big Twelve games were televised during the regular season. They televised some of the Big Twelve tournament. Zach, there were people around the country after the first two years of the Big Twelve that thought you were the dominant pitcher in the Big Twelve because you were the only guy they saw pitch. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, you know, those were the only games on TV, and if you didn't know anything about Texas Tech baseball, you might have thought that I was the good Zach Stewart, because um, those were certainly, you know, those were certainly the kind of the games that, that I got to, and, you know, if, if we hadn't, uh, you know, kind of blown the late lead the year before 97, I'd, I'd have had the first two wins uh, in the Big 12 tournament in 97 and 98, you know, and, and uh, I think the interesting thing about that outing um, Gosh, I think if you look back, that was probably my longest outing by four or five innings or something oh, yeah. like that. And, uh, you know, for the most part, the way that it was in my career, uh, if I got a visit, it was from Coach Hayes saying, hey, great job, and uh, hand me the ball. Uh, and that was one of the few times I ever had a Coach Anderson visit. And uh, right. I don't remember what inning it was that he came out in, and I, I kind of wondered what he was going to say. And he basically came out and said, there's nobody else. So you got to keep going. Um, and I don't care how you get out outs, but you figure it out. Uh, and then, and then he walked off and barring his typical, you know, little, little way just said, well, I guess we got to get some guys out, you know, and yep. just walk back. Well, here you go. You know, that this is an opportunity, you know, as a, as an individual that, that you live for, you know, Hey, my team needs me. Um, it's stretching me way beyond what I normally was, but I really want to beat A&M. And, uh, if, if you remember, they threw chance capel, uh, yeah. in that game. And, uh, you know, he was a teammate of mine at Southlake, uh, a couple years younger than me. And uh, I for certain wasn't going to lose not only to a and but not not to my, my Southlake Carroll Dragon buddy, Chance Capel. Um, so, yeah, it was just empty the tank and throw everything that you have at them and, and hope it's good enough. And I, I'm probably glad they didn't have a radar gun back in those days turned on because it probably <laughs> wouldn't have been very pretty there at the eighth and ninth innings. Got them out, though. That's all that mattered. It was 14-7 when it was all said and done. The all-tournament team was headlined by – the uh, MOP, Josh Bard, he was pretty good. Shane Wright, Brennan Burns, Jason Landreth, uh, and then Keith Ginner all on that all-tournament team. It was a, a, a stellar cast. And again, just a great era of Big 12 baseball. I want to back up a little bit as well. That team to me was really interesting. 97, 98, 99, all those teams, they had their unique personalities. Uh, and a lot of different type of guys but y'all seem to be able to bond around baseball and get get along well. 
when you look back, was, was that one of the hallmarks of that little stretch of baseball that y'all did, did get along well on and off the field for that many different guys having to hang around each other? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, you know, everybody talks about locker room chemistry and is, is it a real thing or, or, or not? I absolutely think it's, it is a real thing, you know, and, and when I came in there in, in 94, you know, guys like Travis Smith and Brandon Kolb and uh, you know, uh, Clint Bryant, Matt Miller, those guys showed me the way to be a good teammate. And, you know, they were very accepting of new guys. And, you know, I've always thought the interesting thing in that era was that we had really good clubhouses and camaraderie, even though we rolled over the roster so much because we were bringing in so many California junior college guys that, you know, if you remember, we had more California guys than we did Texas guys, but yet yeah. we always seemed to, to find a way to, to get along. And, you know, gosh, if you can't get along with, with Brennan Burns and, and, Ryan Reese and, and uh, you know, any number of guys, if you can't get along with those guys and Brad Ralston and, you know, Monty and Monty's little old way, you know, then, then I just, I don't know who you do get along with, but just a very easy team to, to want to be on and, and uh, you know, not big names outside of, you know, a couple of guys, right. but just guys that knew how to play, but it was a little bit more of a scrappy team there in 98, but we could absolutely play as good as the guys in, in uh, 97 could. You know, you guys played hard on the field. You you played hard off the field. How how important was it looking back that Larry Hayes kind of understood and let you guys be yourselves a little bit? It 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 was it was huge for us. You know, um, you, you knew where the the bumpers were, so to speak, right. with, with Coach Hayes and and uh, the great part about playing for such a great man, uh, in addition to being a great coach, was that. You know, nobody wanted to disappoint him. So he didn't have to put rules down because you you, no. you just knew the, the last thing that I want to do is disappoint Coach Hayes, right? And it wasn't you were going to get in trouble or whatnot, but it was just, hey, I can't let that guy down. That That's one of the best human beings that anybody would ever run across in America, not just a coach. And I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize, you know, that relationship nor the, the special team that we had put together there. Do you ever uh, tell any of the kids you work with today when you wrap up and finish a little talk, Merry Christmas? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't because I, I don't know if I could uh, if I could deliver the, the Merry Christmas, you cross eyed dogs and the same uh, fatherly <laughs> tone that, that, that he did. But uh, funny enough, I, I was actually at a baseball tried on, on Sunday and somebody was challenging people to throw a ball underhanded like a softball pitcher. I said, I can do that. But you know who was yep. really good at that? Coach Larry Hayes. He, he, he could beat anybody throwing that ball underhanded like that. That's a good attention getter during infield and uh, workouts. If somebody maybe wasn't exactly where uh, Larry Hayes needed him to be, he could uh, find you real quick with that thing. It was amazing. Yeah. Before we get out of here, Zach, I know you keep up with this uh, current Texas Tech bunch really well. What do you like about them uh, going to Globe Life and then getting into the NCAA tournament? What do you think can be their calling card this year that can uh, win them a few games? Hey, I, I think that they've sort of followed the the tradition that we laid down there in the 90s that, you know, you watch these guys score runs, and I, I think that they can put up runs as, as well as anybody in the nation. Um, I mean, my goodness, the the ball that cash hit walk off on Friday night that cleared the scoreboard. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I'm used to playing in the gorilla ball minus five eras, and I can't remember a ball clearing that scoreboard even in BP in those days. So you watch the way that those guys swing the bat and that there's power up and down the lineup. <clears throat> I think that they can put up some runs on everybody, but you know, just like we've been talking about for the last few minutes that it's all going to come down to pitching, right? You, you've got to find a hot hand or two, um, you know, is it Mason Molina out there, um, you know, kind of playing the Shane Wright role. And then in all of these tournaments, it's, it's always one or two unheralded guys out of the pen because you get to that, you know, fourth game, fifth game, and you start stretching it out. You're going to have to call on a guy like Eric Cooper, like myself, that, you know, had maybe only thrown a couple of innings going up to them. And you're going to ask that guy to go get, you know, two, three, four innings out of it. And and you need the unheralded guys to step up. It, it's not not just the stars. It's the other guys that, that have to step up as well. It's going to be fun to watch. Hey, I appreciate you taking some time, hanging out with us, uh, putting this together. And uh, I, I'm just going to call this part one because when it comes to the, your time at Texas Tech, there's a part two, a part three, a part four, <laughs> and we may have to get a few guys together and uh, do this uh, do this storytelling right later on this summer. All right. Hey, I, I appreciate the time, Ryan. Thanks for uh, letting me, you know, pull the way back machine a little bit. And again, you need to to get that calculator out because there's just no way it's been 25 years. But uh, 
appreciate all the time tonight and the good chat. You got it. He's Zach Stewart, everybody. We hope you've enjoyed our visit. Like we said, we got more coming up for you here in Raiderland. Be sure and check out everything we do, theraiderland.com. Follow us on Twitter at Brian Hyatt Media. For Zach Stewart, I'm Ryan Hyatt. We'll see you soon in Raiderland.